Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. This is DA asking you to into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace family, this is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Yes, indeed. So uh, the paper that we're looking at today, I'm trying to do like five things at once here, so bear with me. You might hear some some silence in the uh, broadcast at times. That's because I'm multitasking like a mf -er right now. Um, yeah, the paper we're doing today is this one. It's about Pan-Africanism, the African Union and the challenge of transformative development in Africa. <clears throat> As you can see, this paper is by Kaleche Ani and Victor Oja Karuto, uh, some brothers from the continent itself, Nigeria and South Africa. So the abstract reads, uh, Pan-Africanism, has remained a powerful force for African development spanning over the past centuries. More still before the rise of the Organization of African Unity or the OAU, a number of Pan-Africanists agitated for a continental organization that championed the political emancipation of the African, uh, sorry, of the African continent from the yoke of colonialism, apartheid, and racism. However, the birth of OAU in 1963 and its transformation into African Union, or the AU, in 2002, uh, led to need for the management of many multi-dimensional contemporary problems facing the continent, which include poverty, external debt, disease, security, and environmental problems, as well as a clash of national interests. This uh, paper traces the African origin of Pan-Africanism and African Union. It shows how the AU has been bedeviled with challenges, thereby crippling the rise of sustainable development in Africa and for Africans. The work, therefore, presents a number of Pan-Africanist ideas that are relevant for transformative development of African states and the enhancement of sustainable integration in Africa. 
keywords are the Pan-Africanism, African Union, colonialism, development. So that would bring us to uh, the introduction of the paper, right? That will bring us to the introduction of the paper. Uh, shout out to, to you, whoever is uh, tuned in right now. I appreciate you uh, tuning in live with me. If you're listening to this on a podcast app, a lot of the fun of the actual broadcast is uh, the interaction with ones inside of the chat room. All right. So, introduction. Pan-Africanism is both a movement and a political ideology that preaches the emancipation of the African people, their society, as well as the existential conditions of African descendants in in the diaspora. It is a movement that had a lot of organizations under its umbrella that championed the course of the empowerment of African descendants It resisted the dehumanizing chains of slavery, as well as agitated for the promotion of African personality and culture. It also resisted intellectual colonialism, as well as political dominance and found expression in different ways. It preached and supported radical nationalism and the transfer of power to Africans. Uh, In Jamanzi, in 2011, argued that some of the major achievements of Pan-African movements were the rise and growth of African nationalism, as well as the resultant decolonization of Africa and the dismantling of apartheid in South Africa. This study is centered on the leadership trait analysis theory. Right, so centered on this leadership trait analysis theory. It showed how the founding fathers of Pan-Africanism used their influence to transform the lives and polity of the African continent. The study which developed qualitative method- methodology conceptualized the idea of Pan-Africanism before accounting for the origin of the movement. It showed that the history of Pan-Africanism cannot be completed without documenting its African foundations. Article highlighted a number of the Pan-African conferences before showing clearly how Pan-Africanism influenced the emergence of the Organization of African Unity, the OAU, which was later transformed into the African Union, the AU. The work highlighted a number of challenges faced by the AU before proffering solutions using the ideological positions of Pan-African leaders. This brings us to the theoretical framework. This study is centered on leadership trait analysis theory. It is a theory that is grounded on the influence of the leadership class to the dynamics of national and international events. The theory was developed by Margaret Herman, and it focuses primarily on how political leaders shape decision-making, especially foreign policy issues. The theory argues that many events in the global village are shaped by the primary and secondary influence of men and women that occupy powerful positions, especially political influence of different forms. While Kesjin, in 2012, has argued that individual leaders do not influence domestic politics of state behavior, but uses their belief, uh, their belief, abilities, motives, and personality to influence foreign policy, the reality of African domestic politics and that of many cultures of the globe is that the quality of leadership in a country significantly influences both the nation-building process and the foreign policy dynamics of the country. So if you remember... Um, when I uh, return to putting out episodes of this podcast, uh, one of the one of the papers we read talked about how you know Afro cent uh, Afrocentric or African centered curriculum is important in creating patriotic leadership, and so here we see uh, where this plays out as well. 
What's going on here now? Here we see where this plays out as well. Uh, refresh your streams. I think I cut out for a second. I don't know why that's happening. Uh, I cut out for a second. Even though I'm hardwired, that still happens every once in a while. Uh, so just refresh your streams. But again, we see where, you know, um, is that the reality of of the African domestic policies and that of many countries of the globe is that the quality of leadership in a country significantly influences both the nation building process and the foreign policy dynamics of a country. So you need quality leadership. You need leadership that's grounded in, in Africanness, right? And so how do you get that, right? You gotta work backwards. If you want quality leadership, in this future uh, uh, nation of Africa that we're trying to, to, to establish, how do we get these quality leaders? That's a fundamental question you have to ask and how you get them is through the education. You have to control the education. You cannot rely on anyone else. It is also a reality today that the words and expressions of political leaders of different countries constitute the major standards of analysis of analyzing international issues, and they are often championed by the multinational or social media. The news correspondents, whether domestic or multinational, continue to follow political leaders in order to document anything they say and give it prominence in their agenda setting rules. For Herman, in 1999, quote, the ways they, I uh, mean the leaders, go about making decisions can influence our lives. The theory of leadership trait analysis is centered on the following. And I want you all to think about something, too, before I read off this, this short list. You know, if you listen to the pro-black perspective, you'll hear only to say talk about being in certain organizations and certain people selling them out and all that kind of stuff. One of them, I think, is uh, Sharpton. And you gotta look at Sharpton. Sharpton is considered a black leader here in America. Al Sharpton is considered a black leader here in America. But was Al Sharpton really trained up in a way, right, that makes him, you know, a patriotic leader? Or was Al Sharpton trained up in a way he'll throw your black ass under the bus? I don't know if you guys know this, but Al Sharpton, like, there's been cases, especially, like, uh, with the Byron Allen case, where Byron Allen had problems getting his content on these different, um, these different cable companies. You know, they put a Al Sharpton out there well, when Byron was calling for like a boycott and stuff like that, they paid and put a Sharpton out there to kind of to kind of sway the people away from boycott. Like he's literally one of these type of Negroes who's paid to kind of quell situations amongst Negroes, or or that you know black folks have. And we will sit here and call him, or some people will sit here and call him black leadership. So the theory of leadership trait analysis is centered on the following. Belief and ability to control events, the need for power and influence, conceptual complexity, self-confidence, task orientation towards solving problems, distrust or suspicion of others, and in-group bias. That's an interesting list. Some of those things, I can definitely see that if you're trying to create, like we see a lot of like, like uh, black focused or African centered uh, schools out here. They have these, what they call leadership programs and stuff. And one of the things I, I would hope that all of them are doing and doing it well is establishing self-confidence in our youth. Remember, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, right? As uh, we talked about a couple weeks ago, within the Ubuntu paradigm, Africans understand that there's complexities within humans. They're not one way or the other, right? Uh, we hope that they're training these children uh, to understand what power is, 
and to understand what in, what influences, what your character and personality, how far that carries you, right? When it's, when when you when you talk about nation building, bringing different peoples together under one umbrella, you're gonna have to have a lot of these characteristics that you see mentioned here, right? The guys like Sharpton and them, for example, they believe that they have the ability to control events. We've given them that belief, right? We've given them the power, and because of that belief, we've, we've given them the power and the influence, right? We've given them the self-confidence, and that's what we need to give all the children, African children around the world, going forward. Everything needs to be about building them up. We, know, we can't talk about nations without building up the, the individuals or the people who constitute the nation. Consequently, all the major Pan-African actors carry in them powerful, charismatic personalities with which they agitated for African emancipation and an end to colonialism as well as African unity, right? How do you know if you are suited for leadership? Well, what's your personality like? A lot of people don't take stock of that. Do you have a charismatic personality? If not, you gotta really think about some stuff. They desire to control and improve the lives of African descendants in the new world while agitating for the rise of Africans in managing their national politics. They suspected the activities of the colonial masters, right? This, is, this goes back to the distrust or suspicion of others. When it comes to these other non-African people, you're supposed to always have a distrust. They suspected the activities of the colonial masters and apartheid rulers as well as the foreign allies who exhibited imperial tendencies more than the culture of societal development, right? This is what you gotta look at. The idea of in-group bias was also used to fight racism, apartheid, and subjugation of Negroes and African descendants, not only in Europe, but anywhere they were used against the people of African origin, right? So three is the methodology. Uh, make sure you guys, if you're listening live or what have you, or you, you listen to the playback, make sure you hit a thumbs up for me. Oh, and shout out to the uh, to the couple of people who recently uh, subscribed to the channel. I do appreciate it. Shout out to you guys. So methodology. Um, this work is a qualitative research that adopted historical method of inquiry into the activities of Pan-Africanist and how it has influenced the rise of the OAU. The work extensively relied on secondary sources of historical writings on Pan-Africanism, journals and books written by Pan-Africanists, as well as Pan-Africanist scholars or apologists were extensively consulted and utilized in the development of this work. Consequently, a number of focus group discussions and interviews targeted at political scholars and analysts were conducted mainly on the challenges of AU. The writers of this paper also integrated their personal analysis on the changing dynamics of AU politics in the course of the development of this article. So this brings us to section four, the idea Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism is a socio-political and cultural phenomenon which regards Africans and African descendants abroad as a unit. Right? Very succinct explanation of what Pan-Africanism is. A socio-political and cultural phenomenon which regards Africans and African descendants abroad as a unit. It seeks to regenerate and unify Africa as well as promote a feeling of oneness amongst the people of the African world. The concept is connotatively used to represent the ideal manifestation of both the African personality and the movement towards the manifest destiny of Africans and their descendants. 
Pan-Africanism is also conceptualized as the quest for Negro emancipation. Negritude stresses the essential unity of the black people who were hitherto suffering in French world, who were hitherto suffering in French world, okay? Wiesbord, in 1973, uh, presented a concept as a 20th century movement of African descendants bonded by international kinship and numerous other short-lived movements with a predominantly cultural element. Langley, in 1973, perceived it as a protest, a demand for African transformation, as well as a utopia born by the centuries of contact between Africa and Europe. Geis in 74 and Thompson in 69 extensively criticized the idea as an irrational concept which was born out of vague emotions. Imagine that. We got some of you, we, we, we got some, uh, some folks who look like us saying that right now, right? But it should be noted that a movement that led to the emergence of OAU cannot be said to be driven by vague emotions. It should be noted that Pan-Africanism is seen by different scholars in the light of their geography, ideology, as well as positions in space and time. I like this paper so far, right? It, 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 it confesses that Pan-Africanism, you know, looks different depending on where you are and in the time and the space you are, right? So, like, we, we read that paper recently that made Pan-Africanism, you know, these folks are trying to make Pan-Africanism become this notion of uh, this global human rights type movement, right? Uh, and then we also see where some folks on the continent think of Pan-Africanism more so as uniting, right, uh, the, co the countries of Africa, right? C you know, kind of seemingly to ignore though, you know, the descendants of Africa outside of the continent. So that's interesting. It's interesting how a term that we outside of the continent, we understand it to be, you know, uh, we understand it to be something more inclusive, you know, uh, it's, about, it's about emancipation for black folks everywhere, you know, regardless of uh, what country, what continent, right? But when you talk to other folks, it seems, uh, the, the definition of Pan-Africanism uh, is being actively changed. To continue, Lagoon argued that Pan-Africanism is essentially a movement of ideas and emotions. At times it achieves a synthesis at times, it remains at the level of antithesis. It could be argued or explained that Lagoon, 1962, attempted a definition of the dynamics of the movement's activities in line with the, uh, the Hegelian philosophy. The Hegelian synthesis of the movement, in this case, includes the general idea of solidarity amongst the descendants of Africa, irrespective of their location, whether in Africa, West Indies, Europe, etc. The antithesis is found in unending disagreement amongst the Pan-Africanists, as well as their analysis of the strategies for the revival, rehabilitation, and retaining of African culture and norms, as well as the path towards transforming the future of African descendants. For instance, Marcus Garvey and W. Uh, e. B. Du Bois disagreed over the future of Negroes outside of Africa. While Du Bois believed that believed and preached that Negroes in the New World uh, should fight to establish their rights in exile, Garvey insisted that their only future lay in their return to Africa. 
I, I, I want to point out something here too. There's something I've been wanting to talk about on this show. Uh, I think I have talked about it a, a little bit, but more so in terms of religion. You know, some of you guys are, politi are political zealots too, socio-political zealots too, when it comes to, to black folks. And so, and, and, and that could be argued even of Garvey, as great as he was, and Du Bois. Just folks who had an idea, they saw it supposed, they, they felt it should go this way, and that's it. When oftentimes, if we're being real honest about the life that we live, right? Oftentimes, the, the, the key is somewhere in between. Somewhere between the two extreme thoughts, the, 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 the two, you know, hard-nosed uh, thinkings. Right, is often where the reality is, right? As you've heard me talk about in this show before, I do believe that ultimately, right, uh, if it makes more sense for Africans to be in the continent, right? But I know that number one, you ain't getting all Africans to go, period. And the notion, and, and for, for various reasons, by the way, right? If you go to Jamaica, let me just school you all to something, right? As a Caribbean person. If you go to Jamaica, you go to the Bahamas, you go, especially you go to those out islands in the Bahamas. As far as those people are concerned, they're in Africa. I don't think y'all hear me. As far as a lot of those people are concerned, people who live in Congo town, etc., right? Uh, Bantu village and all this stuff. People, a, a lot of those people feel they're in Africa already. And unfortunately, the years and the decade and in fact centuries now. That these Africans have been in like the in the, 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 the Caribbean, for example, right? Keeping their African tradition because of the harshness of what slavery was in the Caribbean. Keeping their African traditions, right? You just ain't gonna be you you're not moving those people successfully like that. And so you need to pivot. You need to think about a different way to organize these folks. And to think that only there's only one way is sometimes it's foolhardy. And we tend to and we we tend to go down this route this route. And when that happens, right, then all sorts of people become, at least in the in the zealot's mind, invalidated. If a person's pushing confusion, like for example, uh, I'd say it's Tariq Nishid, Yvette Carnell, those type of folks, then get them out of it. Get them out of it. But when we talk in serious discourse now, we have to be open to thinking or seeing things from the other side sometimes. To continue, Davi formed the Black Star Line that was meant to transport African descendants back to their ancestral continent, but the, but the ambitious project failed before its death in London in 1940. It should be noted that even after the death of Gavi, the Pan-African idea of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, UNIA which he started in his, in his country, Jamaica, in 1914, did not die. The traditional components of the idea of Pan-Africanism include the belief that Africa is the homeland of Africans and many other colored people in different parts of the world. Solidarity among men and women groups of, of African origin found all over the globe. The belief in a distinct African personality that should be promoted by her children in every part of the universe. You see, these Pan African, these Pan Africanists who, who they're summarizing from, are telling you that, you know, black folks are all over the world, not just on the continent, and so you have to work accordingly. 
the need for the development of Africa, especially ensuring that Africans take pride in their culture, the need for Africans and their descendants to manage African politics, oversee religion, and direct their economic future. Six, the promotion of a united and prosperous future for Africans and their descendants anywhere in the globe. Anywhere in the globe, right? African origin of Pan-Africanism. There are many accounts on the origins of Pan-Africanism. Each scholarly analysis depends on the geographical and ideological disposition of the analyst. Right? What, what did I just talk about? Right? The, this, the, the disposition of the analyst. We got to be careful about that. Sometimes the analyst can be a zealot. Remember what zealots did to Malcolm X? While some scholars trace the birth of Pan-Africanism Pan to the Caribbean and West Indies, others link it to the Black or African Americans as well as to Europe. However, in this study, the African origin of Pan-Africanism will be, will be presented. It is worthy to note that in studying Pan-Africanism, one must endeavor to avoid what Langley in 1973 called the tyranny of dates and labels. I like that. The tyranny of dates and labels. This is because it is challenging historical tasks for one to engage in the Herculean task of documenting the chronology of Pan-Africanist events in the form of time perspectives. Okay. However, Pan-Africanism in, uh, in Africa can be traced to the earliest phase of Atlantic slave trip. It was a time when the African people in different societies rose up with arms to fight the pale, strange men that invaded their societies and began to forcefully abduct their people before exporting them on the dehumanizing situations to the new world. John H. Clark, an African-American, gave uh, Philip to the above ideology when he wrote that for a period of more than a hundred years, African warrior nationalists, mostly kings, outmaneuvered and outgeneraled some of the best military minds of Europe. They planted the seeds of African independence for another generation to harvest. Their Pan-Africanism was more military than intellectual, but it was Pan-Africanism. I like that quote. Have you guys heard that quote before? Let me know in the comment section. By the time Atlantic slave trade was institutionalized due to a combination of the superior firepower of the European slave merchants and the collaborative efforts of the African mercenaries, the Western merchants began to export many Africans to America, Europe, and West Indies. There, the few slaves that survived began to form groups to resist the inhuman treatment meted against them while demanding that they should be repatriated back to Africa, their motherland. Lagoon wrote that there were no fewer than 240 slave, slave risings in the United States alone, and an unknown number in the West Indies. The most important was a successful revolt in Haiti that was led by Toussaint Louverture from 1971, from 1791, sorry, dyslexic, from 1791 to 1803. Not dyslexic, just joking. These risings were the striving of men to be free and equal, right? A few years after the American independence of 1776, a number of African Americans began to criticize European colonial ambition in Africa. In 1787, a committee in the then African Lodge, led by Prince Hall, sent a petition to the American Legislative Assembly 
in Massachusetts. They complained about the humiliating living conditions of African descendants, which was against the constitutional provisions of the country. They therefore revealed their intention to repatriate Africans to their mother continent and requested for legislative assistance, which did not see the light of the day. They carried their agitations to the Civil Liberties Organization, CLO, the rise of Paul Kufi as a main actor in the African, sorry, in the Union Society of Africans in Newport, USA, led to the selective emigration of many Africans back to Sierra Leone, where they began to expand the message of Pan-Africanism. In 1808, uh, he started the Friendly Society of Sierra Leone. The group promoted Pan-Africanist ideology. Gradually, some free slaves like Richmond of Virginia and others that have successfully used ransom and other socioeconomic strategies to emancipate themselves began to raise money not only for the resettlement of Afro-Americans to Liberia, but the expansion of the Pan-African teachings there. While some Pan-Africanists like, Dr. Du, like uh, du Bois opposed the resettlement of Africans, to their mother continent, they were still active in empowering the wind of Pan-Africanism in, Af in Africa. And, so that, and that's the thing, so that's my big criticism with Duke. Like, in that time that you're talking about, in this time that we're talking about here, right? Uh, starting in 1808, to, you know, the first Pan-African Congress was in 1901, I believe. Like, in that time, that was the time to get Africans up out of the U.S. That really was the time to get the mindset of Africans right, to get Africans out of the U.S. And Du Bois is one of the people who, albeit was involved in Pan-Africanism, was not a fan of Africans returning or, or uh, repatriating back to the continent, which was just foolishness. So now, after all this time has passed now, right, a hundred and some years later, since Du Bois' time, you know, his earlier days, right, you really ain't gonna get you really don't get folks, folks who do all kind of stuff now, claim Cherokee, you know, uh, Blackfoot, and all this old shit just to stay in America now. The suffering and hardship faced by many Africans in the era of apartheid and colonialism dramatically increased the influence of Pan-Africanism into the remote parts of Africa. Wadajo, in 1964, documented that in America itself, the seeds of Pan-Africanism were implanted the moment the first alien colonizer set foot on her soil. The multidimensional negative impacts of colonialism and the suffering of blacks in the apartheid South African state spread the message of Pan-Africanism as African nationalists were writing, making references and demanding for support towards the strategies that will end colonialism and apartheid. Thus, as the number of educated Africans increased, the studies, discussions, and writing on Pan-Africanism began to grow. Edward W. Blyden wrote extensively on the idea of common destiny between the African descendants in the New World and those in Africa. During the establishment of the Liberian College, he warned the staff and students against the danger of Africans losing their traditions and becoming assimilated, right? And that's what has happened to the Americanized African. They become assimilated. So this is why you'll have, as I've, as I've clowned before on this show, you'll have Tone Talks from ADOS sitting up here in videos talking about how he's more like Europeans than he is like Africans. That Negro is lost. To continue, Africans that have attended the Pan-African conferences of the 20th century 
We're joined by other Pan-African ambassadors that are relocated from Europe and America to Africa. It began to give Pan-Africanism all manners of, of interpretations that would advance the status of the African man and woman. However, the physical and intellectual contacts between African students abroad and Pan-Africanists, as well as those who were educated, who were dedicated readers of the journals, monograph, newspapers, and magazine articles of Pan-African apologists, of Pan-African apologists, increased the number and influence of the movement. According to Dagnini in 2008, African-based Pan-Africanists that claim to have their inspirations from Marcus Garvey include Kwame Nkrumah, first president of the independent Ghana in 57, Leopold Sadar Senghor, uh, Senghor, the first president of independent Senegalese state in 1960. In 1960, others include the father of negritude, Patrice Lumumba, the first prime minister of the independent Congo in 1960, Julius Nair, the first president of independent Tanzania in 1962, and Jomo Kenyatta, the first president of independent Kenya in 1964. It should be noted that Nelson Mandela, the first black president of South Africa, who doubled as the anti-apartheid legend, was also influenced by Garvey. It would be, it would be recalled that when Kwame Nkrumah moved from USA to Britain in 1945, George Padmore made him the regional secretary of the Pan-African Federation. Soon he was joined by Jomo Kenyatta of, Ke of Kenya and Peter Abrams of South Africa to organize the 1945 conference in Manchester. Representatives of the African National Congress in South Africa were invited for the conference, but they were denied visa. The act of visa denial was a strategy of preventing anti-colonial activists from foreign trips that would reduce their alliance and agitations, as well as preventing the spread of Pan-African knowledge of the wider world. This is why Gavi was prevented from entering Africa. At the Congress, uh, Nkrumah met many people from Anglophone colonies who were already or would become national political activists on their return to Africa. There were no, there were no representatives from Francophone Africa. There were two or more men, one from Somali and Mercy Sa'ad Eldin, who attended as an observer from Egypt. Mercy Eldin was Egypt's first cultural attaché to the United Kingdom. At the end of the 1945 conference, Nkrumah brought together Kojo, Botsio, Bankoli, Awuno, uh, Renner, Ashi, Nikoi, uh, Wallace Johnson, and Bankoli Akpata to start the West African National Secretariat. So this allows you to get an idea of the genealogy, starting from Gavi, right, to uh, to to activists or leaders on the continent, right? Uh, um, I'll be curious to know who are the, and if you're in the chat room and you know, who are the, uh, who are the descendants of Du Bois, right? And who are, who are the ones influenced by Du Bois on the continent? I'd just be curious to see that. Kojo Botsio, uh, at the time, was a postgraduate student of geography and education in Brasenos at in, uh, in Brasenos College, Oxford University, and later became a major national and international actor in Ghana's politics. Minister of Social Welfare, Transport, Agriculture, Trade, etc. Um, Awuna Renner was an advocate of a united, a strong, free, and independent, federated West African state, right? 
G. Ashi and Koi, I'm um, sorry, Nikoi, represented the Aborigines Rights Protection Society at Manchester Conference. Akpara was a Nigerian communist who returned to Nigeria with a PhD from Charles University, Prague in 1953 and was exiled in 1960 because of his communist ideology and he joined Nkrumah. WANs had the following aims. Let me go back and check something here. WANs is the West African National Secretariat. West African National Secretariat had the following aims. To supply information with a view to realizing a West African front for United West African National Independence, B, to educate the peoples, especially the working class, in the imperialist countries concerning the problems of West Africa, C, to foster a spirit of national unity and solidarity within West Africa, and D, to engineer the formation of an all-West African National Congress. So one of the things I always, I always wonder, and I had this conversation with Sister Renee, who's uh, usually in the chat room the other day. Um, you know, we, we get Africans who always come and say something. When I say Africans, I mean all of us, inside and outside the continent. We get Africans who always say something like, you know, one of the things we need to do is foster a spirit of, of unity and solidarity amongst our people. But no one ever breaks down how you go about that. And I think it's time now, like I was telling the, the musician uh, Athrazer on, on Twitter, right? I was telling him something in a, in, in, in a, in a little uh, discussion we were having that, you know, there's an old biblical saying, fate without works is dead, right? And I extend that to be like rhetoric without works. It's just dead. Like, what's the strategy? Oh, I see the, uh, the pro-black perspective is in the room. Peace to you, brother Oni. Um, you know, what's the, what's the strategy of fostering a spirit of national unity and solidarity? Like, what is it? It sounds really good. Are we gonna create, you know, softball leagues? In, you know, like, you know, are, are we gonna do like uh, debates? Like, what are we doing exactly to create this this uh, this spirit of national unity? To continue, by the time Nkrumah started the Convention People's Party (CPP) of Gold Coast, he invited George Padmore, who drew the party's constitution. The third aim of the Constitution was to support the demand for West African Federation and Pan-Africanism by promoting unity of action among the peoples of Africa and of African descent. Gradually, he used his political position and leadership to plan for the Kumasi Conference of December 1953, which was to be the forerun of the 1954 Pan-African Conference in Ghana. It would be recalled that in November 1946, representatives of West African National Secretariat, which is WANS, Pan-African Federation, PAF, and the League of Colored People, LCP, and the Transvaal Council of Non-European Trade Union, TCNTU, sent a resolution to the United Nations Trusteeship Council, UNTC, urging them to reject South Africa's demand to incorporate the mandate territory of Southwest Africa. Right? So representatives of West Africa's National Secretariat, Pan-African Federation, the League of Colored People, and the Transvaal Council of Non-European Trade Union sent a resolution to the United Nations Trusteeship Council, urging them to reject South Africa's demand 
to incorporate the Mandate Territory of Southwest Africa. They stated that the policies pursued by the South African government towards those of non-European uh, origin in their state were direct negation of the principles of racial tolerance, justice, and freedom. Okay, now I now I now I figured out what's going on. Okay, um, TCNTU also argued that the Indians in South Africa were suffering the same fate of de of dehumanization faced by Africans, and demanded that it should end. Like what? Why are you concerning yourself with those folks? I know some of you are listening to this and are like, God damn, like, again, I don't believe in this, in this global human rights or human, you know, human rights justice thing that folks are trying to make Pan-Africanism. In the chat room, the brother, the, the pro-black perspective podcast, brother only says, that's a good list of people influenced by Gavi. Yeah, it's a very good list. And what'll really be cool to, to do, for, um, you know, for me to do, is really start to study down, you know, this quote unquote discipleship of Gavi, right? They're not direct disciples per se, but it'll be good to study down to see who do they then influence, right? As this paper has kind of alluded to and so forth and so on. And, I, and that's why I asked a question because there is something to like a discipleship, right? If you go to academia and you look at PhD students or people with PhDs, there's a discipleship that, that goes there, right? There is, and that discipleship tends to have a benefit to it as well, right? If you worked under Eric Kandel at Columbia University in neuroscience, right? There are doors that open for you, especially when he gives his voice, right, to your name, right? You know, in other words, he gives like a good uh, recommendation, right? There, there's a, there's a, and so the, the same thing can be true here of the disciples of, say, one Gavi versus one W.E.B. Du Bois. I talked about this a couple weeks ago. I couldn't remember the guy's name at the time. Uh, I, do, I do think only time I say posted and then I remembered it as well. This guy named Thomas Sowell in America. Not a dunce, but he is a seller. And how you, how, how you can judge him is by his quote-unquote philosophical offspring. His philosophical offspring include guys like Larry Elder, and if you're outside of America, you probably don't know who I'm talking about, but if, you, if you're in America, you'll know exactly who I'm talking about. Larry Elder, uh, Candace Owens, uh, Jesse Lee Peterson, uh, you know, except, uh, what's the guy, the, the, the Republican black guy? Uh, so, something West, I think it is. Right? Like, that's all you... If, if someone was to try to describe Thomas Sowell to you, and they use the people who, who cite Sowell the most, the, like I said, the philosophical or, or, or ideological offspring, like Candace Owens and Larry Elder and stuff like that, you already know who the fuck Thomas Sowell is. Right? And so when you look at the people who come from Gavi and the people who come from those people, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a very interesting study. And then the last thing I'll say about that is, who are your ideological and, or, and or philosophical offspring? Who are your philosophical and, ide and ideological offspring. You gotta think about that, especially if you're a parent. 
At the very least, it should be your children or others who are, who are around you, right? So this is what this is what you got to keep in mind as you go out here and do this work in the chat room. Harsh Reality Podcast. Shout out to the Harsh Reality Podcast to all of them. Uh, D Web, El Miguel, uh, Reese. Um, the same people of color nonsense. The rhetoric is everywhere. Well, yeah, I mean, hey, if you want to diminish uh, any black movement, start including non-black people, right? Start including non-black people. Start, start letting them use the game. The whole it's not racist, economic type stuff, and that that takes every that takes all the steam out of any work you're trying to do on behalf of black people. So that brings us to part six of uh, the paper, which is called the Pan-African Conferences. Uh, seeing um, the, uh, the Hosh Rally podcast comment reminds me, this is probably a good time to take a station ID break. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you to tune into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. And we're back. Make sure you guys tune in too, as you see. Uh, they tuned into my show, so you tune into their show, right? But tune into the Harsh Reality Podcast, uh, the the Pro Black Perspective, uh, and the Queen's Council with Sharice, and uh, and look out for new shows, new ideas coming on KWAZ Radio in twenty twenty one. So we had a section of the paper called the, pra- the Pan-African Conferences. Uh, the rise of Pan-African Conferences in the 20th century was a major force that gave Philip to increase participation of African-based Pan-Africanists. Gradually, the conference that was held in order that was held in other co- continents, shifted its base to Africa. I guess that means other continents. Shifted its base to Africa, and later found major political expression in the formation of the Organization of African Unity, the OAU. The first Pan-African Conference was held in London in 1900. It was organized by Henry Sylvester William from Trinidad. The conference del- uh, deliberated on how to expand the activities of the movement. It had three Africans in attendance. Is this guy reusing stuff from another paper? Um, the 1900 London Conference was followed by other set of conferences that was organized by Dr. William E. Berghardt, uh, Du Bois. Du Bois was a f- okay. So so by W. E. B. Du Bois. God damn. Du Bois was a founding member of the National Association for the advancement of colored people, the NAACP. He championed the second, third, fourth, and fifth conference of Pan-Africanism. The second conference was held in Paris in 1919. That conference was significant in Afrocentric analysis as M. Blaise um, Diange, a prominent Senegalese leader, was instrumental to his success. Are you guys familiar with M. Blaise Diange, a prominent Senegalese leader. If you are, tell me in the chat uh, what you know about that brother. Thus, for the first time, Africans graduated from mere participants and listeners to organizing members. In 1921, there were dual Pan-African conferences in London and Brussels. Two years later, Du Bois championed the 1923 conferences that were held in London and Lisbon. Then in 1927, he presided over the New York Pan-African Conference. Jomo Kenyatta and Kwame Nkrumah 
were amongst the organizers of the 1945 Pan-African Congress held in Manchester, Britain. There were a number of other African people in attendance. It should be noted that at the end of the conference, they resolved as follows. One, the complete and absolute independence for the peoples of West Africa. Two, the removal of British armed forces from Egypt. Three, the granting of complete independence from Egyptian and British rule to the Sudan. Four, the recognition of the demands of the indigenous peoples of Tunis, Algeria, Morocco, and Libya from French and Italian rule. So, if you look at those countries, those countries are more so Arab, aren't they? But here they are, you know, demanding for the indigenous people uh, to be, to be, to be, you know, recognized. You know, one of these days, we really got to sit down as a people in, 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 in on this uh, platform and really talk about what Pan-Africanism really needs to be defined as. It's becoming obvious now, right? Are the conquering Arabs in, in, in Northern African states, are they a part of Pan-Africanism? Democratic rights and self, uh, go, this is number five, democratic rights and self-governments for the people of Kenya, Uganda, Tanganyika, uh, Nyasaland, uh, Somaliland, and Zanzibar. Six, the non-incorporation of uh, Bikunaland, Besutuland, and Swaziland in South Africa. Seven, West Indian Federation founded upon internal self-government based on universal adult suffrage. That's interesting. I remember uh, growing up as a kid, right, uh, in the Caribbean, I remember uh, there was always this talk of, like, if we unified the Caribbean the way we unified Caribbean cricket, we would be a nation to behold. And I always, you know, every once in a while I think about that. The withdrawal of the, uh, hey, the withdrawal of the British military administration from Ethiopian soil. And nine, the independence or at least self-governance for all of British, French, and Italian colonies in Africa and West Indies. The conference raised the consciousness of Africans present that the quest for political power is fundamental in the road towards the attainment of Pan-African goals. They were to carry the message against racial discrimination and force labor home. Workers were to engage in unending industrial actions and boycotts while the intellectual elite continued to advance uh, new interpretations that enhance Pan-Africanist goals. So this brings us to section seven. Uh, in the chat room, the Harsh Reality Podcast. You guys, make sure y'all, make sure y'all tune into the Harsh Reality Podcast. Uh, I don't know what they prefer you to listen on, but you know, let's help build a YouTube channel as well. Um, the Harsh Reality Podcast says, I believe they may be speaking on the Berbers in that region. Okay. Okay. Um, so section seven is Pan-Africanism, the journey from OAU to AU. The boys and a number of other personalities present in the 1945 Pan-African Congress drafted a memorandum that was presented to the newly formed United Nations, or UN. They demanded the adequate representation of colored peoples of the world within the United Nations organization. The memorandum was signed by 36 organizations from Americas, Africa, and Britain. Also on February 1st, 1946, WANS, W-A-N-S, uh, held a conference in London. 
they resolved that the UN should support West Africa, that should, should support West Africa to attain her independence and demanded that the UN should ensure the end of colonialism everywhere, especially in Africa. So you, you went to the, you went to colonizers to demand the end of colonization everywhere, especially in Africa. I mean, all right. Wines informed the UN that the then geographical divisions and boundaries in Africa, which exist till to, uh, today, I guess, to date, are politically, socially, economically, as anti the interests of the people from, from a security point of view. They lamented over the monopoly of the British to the raw materials of Africans and, the, and demanded the total independence of Africans. So let's, let's, let's break that last sentence down for a second, right? And we've talked about this ad nauseum on the show, I know. But Britain has a monopoly to the raw materials of Africa. You think they're going to give that up because you asked? Is, is, is the UN some neutral military that's going to go in and wreak havoc? On, on, on the British to get their hands up out of your pocket in Africa? And this is why I talked to when, when we talked about like the supranational state or whatever, right? Or, or the supernation, potential supernation of Africa. I mentioned how wouldn't it be neat to have a African army represented you know that that represents all of the nations within within the continent of Africa. Could you imagine what that would look like? Uh, you know, and, and with making and also making sure that it had the balls instead of, oh, you know, you know, being diplomatic. Maybe you might ask first. Okay, sure. But after you don't pay me no mind. We organize and get this army popping? Immediately, Nkrumah began, uh, became the Ghanaian prime minister. Uh, he organized a conference of independent African states in Accra from the 15th to 22nd of April of 1958. Eight African countries were present. They include Egypt, Ethiopia, Ghana, Liberia, Libya, Morocco, Sudan, and Tunisia. In his opening remarks, Nkrumah stated that, quote, we, the delegates of this conference, in promoting our foreign relations, must endeavor to seek the friendship of all and the enmity of none. We stand for international peace and security in conformity with the United Nations Charter. Listen to that, listen to that talk right there. This will enable us to assert our own African personality and to develop according to our, our ways of life, our own customs, traditions, and cultures. The Accra Conference is significant because it is the first time African affairs were discussed at an African intergovernmental level. The participants resolved uh, to be united in cooperation and negotiations with economic, political, social, and cultural relations while pledging direct assistance to Algerian revolutionaries and the opponents of apartheid South African government. They came up with a Joint Economic Research Commission, JERC, well, that's an interesting title, uh, that would enhance economic research and cooperation. The members pres pr uh, present also agreed to consult with the United Nations on issues uh, con con consigning Consigning Africa. It is noteworthy that they resolve that the political leaders of independent African states will meet at least once every two years, while their foreign ministers or other, represent or other representatives meet from time to time. They declared the 15th of April every year as a day to be celebrated as the, as the African Freedom Day, while calling for an end to colonialism in Africa. 
Uh, has that been followed through? Has, does anyone know if that's been followed through? In December 1958, Nkrumah also hosted the All African People's Conference, the AAPC, and, uh, in Accra. Gradually, what started as a conference of independent African states graduated into a union of African independent states whose motto was independence and unity. Soon, Sekou Toure of Guinea, President William Tubman of Liberia, and Nkrumah enhanced the idea of African solidarity and liberation. After the January 25th to 30th Conference of Independent African States in Tunis, the idea over the future of Africa became divided among those who wanted total integration and those who believed that the integration of the continent should be a gradual process. I put out the question to you guys today in, in uh, I said 19, in 2020, right? Are you for total integration or are you for uh, integration of the continent being a gradual process? I put it out to you guys who are listening live. And by the way, I appreciate everyone who's listening live today. Shout out to KW Don Seven, who says the UN themselves were caught stealing minerals from the Congo. They are not a neutral party. They are there to maintain the white hegemonic system. Absolutely. And so going to beg them, like, it, it, are the Africans, our, 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 uh, our previous or former African leadership, so gullible to think that these guys will, will create justice in Africa? Like, was that the case, or was there something deeper going on? Right, so that's my second question. The first question that I want to know, do you guys believe in total integration, or do you believe in that the integration of the continent should be a gradual process? This question is for 2020. The division manifested in the Addis Ababa Congress of the then independent African states held from the 14th to the 26th of June in 1960. Uh, the independence of Guinea, Togo, Cameroon, Nigeria, Congo, and Somaliland intensified the bond of African unity in their aim of ending colonialism in the continent. Ghana championed the rise of a union of African states with no economic, political, and other barriers. Okay. Here's a third question. Do we constantly need the development of new unions and whatnot? Like, is that something we always have to have? This new union of this came up, and the union of that came up, and the organization of this came up, and the organization of that came up. Right? It seems like we do more work creating new unions and organizations and what have you than actual work. Is it just me, or does anyone else agree with me as well? That was a radical approach to the future of the continent, but those who wanted a gradual process of African unity held their meeting in Abidjan first, and later in Brazzaville, where they fortified themselves into a political bloc comprising the Congo, Brazzaville, Ivory Coast, Senegal, Mauritania, Cameroon, and Madagascar. The Brazzaville bloc uh, graduated into the Casablanca bloc. So that, that, I'll add bloc to those terms as well. Unions, organizations, blocks, like, what are we really doing? Is it just me? What are we really doing? However, in May 1961, Guinea and Mali left the Brazzaville uh, Casablanca bloc group, sorry, and joined the Monrovian Congress that gave birth to the Monrovian bloc. There were other forms of conflict of interest amongst the two groups in the Lagos Conference of the Monrovian bloc. Emperor Haile Selassie I criticized the division of Africa into blocs. 
and the charters for a united African organization that was submitted by Nigeria. Yeah, I criticize all, this, all these blocks too. Uh, Nigeria, Liberia, and Ethiopia were examined. Like, my God, can we do the work? The purpose of the proposed charter was the rise of a permanent continental body that would promote better life of the African people through cooperative actions of member states. In February 1962, the Pan-African Freedom Movement for East, Central, and Southern Africa pledged to establish a federation which will serve as their first steps towards the realization of full political unity for Africa. An African freedom movement. On the 22nd of May, 1963, the Casablanca and Moravian blocs assembled in Addis Ababa, where they agreed to ensure the rise of African unity. Haile Selassie spoke on the need for African unity as a road to development. Consequently, the charter institutionalizing the OAU was ratified by participating governments, and it had the following aims. To promote the A, to promote the unity and solidarity of the African states. B, to coordinate and intensify their cooperation and efforts. C, to achieve a better life for peoples of Africa. To promote, again, I ask a question, what does it mean? You know, I, I, okay, I, I know what it means to promote the idea, but how is it, how is it really, how is it enacted? And you guys in the chat, um, I in the chat room on the comments say, you guys can let me know if, uh, you know, what ways do you think we can promote solidarity, right? Of African states, but as well as those of us uh, who are who are groups of Africans outside of the continent, what activities, what you know, whatever, can we do, you know, to to bring about this this unity and solidarity? Because if you look at this list, you would need to nail that down first before you could move on to the other two items. Right. D. Uh, to def also, so there's more. D. To defend their sovereignty, their territorial integrity and independence. E. To eradicate all forms of colonialism from Africa. And F. To promote international cooperation, having due regards to the Charter of the United Nations and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In the chat room, I see there's some activity. Uh, let me get to that. Sister Renee is here, PC Usus. Um, weak leadership, I'm sorry. Yeah, weak leadership uniting and discussing African issues will only lead to weak solutions. We don't have leaders who are truly fighting for the sovereignty of Africa. KW Don 7 um, says Urugu. It's not going to loosen their grip off the raw materials of Africa peacefully. It has to be by force, just like reparations for Africans in the diaspora. Sister Renee says to KW Dawn 7, you're absolutely right. And I agree. I agree. I mean, it's amazing how much rhetoric we engage in. That sounds good oftentimes, but is it really work, though? Is rhetoric work? And that's something we gotta discuss. You know, I was, I was thinking one of these days to do a show where I, I'm not reading any particular paper, but we're just discussing. And you know, this is a chance for me to ask the folks who are present, like, would you guys be down for just a, a conversation? Right, and uh, upcoming episodes where it's just a conversation, and we talk about like some of the goals, really, of 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 building this African nation that we want to see. 
you know, if not in our lifetime, but in, in, in the future. And really talk about some of these issues like, you know, like rhetoric, like, you know, promoting, uh, promoting unity. If you guys are interested in that, let me know in the chat room or in the comment section if that's something um, that you guys will be interested in. Be interested in. Uh, I see there's more activities. Before I continue, let me read it off. KW Don Seven says uh, it should be a gradual integration of trade to allow time for manufacturing on the continent to develop and to develop trade routes. And supply chains. You see, I could get behind something like, like what KW Don is saying. It, it, it's 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 actually it's actually something you can you can feasibly see and you can work on. It's not just some generalized statement like, yeah, we'll work on unity. And we'll work on, you know, um, in a group economics. Well, how? And I'm tired of the excuse that that people's is watching, so we don't want to put all the business out there. Man, look here. Either you're gonna do it or you you're gonna do it or you're not. They don't do too much hiding from your black ass, so are you doing it or not? Sister Renee says Africans must fall out of love with Urugu before we can unite. Uh, Urugu and their money and, and religions. Uh, that's true in the continent. That's true in the Americas, too. That's true here, too. Um, one of the reasons why you won't get black folks to leave, say, like America, for example, is because They'll be too far away from white people if they leave. And if we're too far from white people, well, who, you know, what, what, you know, where are we going to get another white mommy and daddy from to do all the shit for us? All right? This is our problem out here. Our problem out here, you know, like, like we're talking about... You know, recently on, on social media, we, we were talking about, like, the vaccine, and and uh, I think only time I say, yeah, only time I say I brought it up, talking about the vaccine and blah, blah, blah. The truth about this vaccine stuff is we should have been, we should have had our own scientists working on a vaccination. People who have us in mind, who don't want to see our destruction, who, do, who don't, who don't love to see us being damaged or hurt in any kind of way. So our own people should have been working on vaccines. So if I have uh, some hesitation to taking this white guy's, uh, you know, vaccine, I'm not wrong in my hesitation in that, right? But at the same time, my bigger complaint is that we didn't do anything. And that's, what, and that's the problem with a lot of black folks like in America, where you come to the idea, even for, the, for, for immigrants who come to America, right? Black and otherwise. Well, the idea, especially black, the idea is that when you come here, white folks are doing all the work here. They're making this shit run and be great or whatever, right? And you get to benefit off it. And the reality is you don't get to benefit off it if you're not doing nothing. We have a problem of a bunch of do-nothings amongst us. And the ones who do stuff, unfortunately, they, they get co-opted uh, co to actually do the work for white people. You know, you've seen the movies where, you know, those sisters who were working at NASA and figuring out all the complex math and all that stuff have to go take a pee break uh, a quarter of a mile away from, you know, from the office that they were working in. Come on. That's what will happen if we are not doing the shit ourselves. If we're not sending rockets into space or satellites into space. and we have the intelligence to do it, we'll be doing it for these other people. So it's not just in the continent, but it's here as well. 
we got a we we have a problem with a lot of do nothings and those who are doing something they're doing it for our enemy which is why i push the idea of education to continue thomas in 1969 revealed that pan-africanism is a campaign to rehabilitate the valuable aspects of of the african culture and that the phenomenon means the political unification of the African continent. As said, in 1980, while giving credence to the role of Pan-Africanism in the rise of OAU, asked the following rhetorical questions. How can a phenomenon which has been institutionalized in the OAU still remain a utopia? And what is irrational about seeking the solidarity of the African world and, Ill, and inculcating pride in Africa's past and culture? It will be recalled that by the end of the 1990s, colonialism has largely ended on the African political stage. Then major actors like uh, Olu Segun, Obasanjo, Thabo, Mbeki, uh, Adulaziz, Bootflika of Algeria, Hosni, uh, uh, Mubarak of Egypt were talking of the African Renaissance through poverty eradication and societal development. Ironically, Gaddafi was fully engaged in the politics of building a united Africa. The problem with Gaddafi, Gaddafi is unrepentant, Arab. So who was Gaddafi fully engaged in the politics of building Africa, uh, building a united Africa for? You see, you gotta, you gotta understand the game, right? The Arabs who run Egypt and claim that the Egyptians were all Arab, Think about this stuff. These, these are these same types of people, right? Gaddafi might, might have been doing some good. I'm not saying he wasn't doing some good, but let's be honest, who did he prioritize the most? Uh, Dr. John Henry Clark is to tell that story of Gaddafi when these Arabs were leaving uh, Libya to go to school in uh, Europe, he would tell them, well, if you go out there and you start to lay up with European women, don't bother to come back. Essentially is what he was saying. Because the offspring of your, you know, dalliances with European women won't make a strong, what did he say? Did he say a strong African? Or did he say a strong Arab? It won't make a strong Arab. So you might as well just, you and them might as well just stay out there. Right? The guy was Arab centered. Consequently, during the extraordinary session of the OAU, Assembly of Heads of State and Government at Certe, Libya, in September 1999, Gaddafi launched a powerful campaign which led to the establishment of the African Union, AU, instead of Gaddafi's United States of Africa. In the Loam Summit of the OAU leaders that was held on the 11th of July 2000, the Constitutive Act of the African Union was approved and opened for a signature by member states. While many countries signed in Loam, it took two years more for the African Union to be, f to be launched in July 2002 in Durham, South Africa. So that brings us to section eight of uh, this paper. Let me check in with the chat room. KW Dawn 7 says, current infrastructure was developed for Europeans to extract raw materials from Africa to Europe. Uh, there has to be infrastructure developed for intra-continental trade. That's, that's absolutely correct. 
And you know what's funny? When you read, this shows you how these folks operate, right? When you read like, uh, uh, what's the book called? Um, I'm forgetting the, the, the ghost of King Leopold, is it? Um, when you read that book, you'll read that when the Belgians and stuff got up out of there, all the train systems and all that shit they built to be able to extract that rubber, like to get that rubber uh, plant and its byproducts out of there, they destroyed all that shit. They destroyed all of it, right? So, so yes, the, the infrastructure was set up just for Europeans to be able to get what they what they came for, right? Uh, K.W. Don says, there must be African solutions to African problems, absolutely. Renee, Sister Renee says, I would be open to getting together and discussing unity strategies. Yeah, I think that's something, I think that's something that's important. I think until people get together and talk about, well, what what factors bring people together? Look, we, we, we got folks in the continent who, who talks about, you know, Senegal versus, say, Kenya's Jolof. And who's better and who's not? I mean, so what are the things that we're going to do that's really about unifying? That, that's something I've always wondered. Like, what are these things? Just talking about unifying is not enough. So yeah, I think it's important to sit down and discuss. Well, what are these unifying these 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 what are these unifying or, or unity strategies that people keep talking about? KW Don Seven says uh, Gaddafi was an opportunist. His plan of having a gold-backed uh, United currency would have benefited. The yeah, absolutely. That that whole gold-backed um, currency that was that was to benefit his Arab world. Gaddafi was an Arab first. He was an African second. Look it up. Right? Uh, so Sister Renee said, Sister Renee said she'll be down for that discussing unity strategies. If anyone else is down for it, you know, speak up and, and, and even suggest, you know, would Saturday evening be the better time for you guys? Let's just sit down and chop it up. Let's talk about you know, how you can get Africans together. Uh, the pro-black perspective comes in and says, the reference to Leopold reminds me of this cis from Nigeria complaining about how the trains in China need you to read in Mandarin. Duh, it's not your train. It is, it's not your friggin' train. It's a Chinese train. If you can't read that shit, they have a uh, ping pong, ging gong, ging gong. Um, if you can't read that shit, it tells you that shit wasn't for you. Oh, the, uh, the, uh, the pro-black perspective is doing a class for unity, not too many take. Oh, so we could join in, um, we can join in, um, with the pro-black perspective, either way, but I, I, I'm willing to, to do a show and let's just sit down and talk about like, what are these? What are these uh, strategies for unity? Oh, my, the pro-black perspective says, my bad, I meant train in Nigeria. Oh, so I just wasted that whole Chinese uh, ping pong, ging gong, ging. I just wasted that just now, right? Uh, so this brings us to section eight. Uh, when President Muammar Gaddafi, I'm sorry, the, the, the section is called AU Challenges and the African Development. When the president, Muammar Gaddafi, was pushing for the rise of a continental political body, he proposed to be called the United States of Africa, 
Many African leaders did not welcome the idea. The changing dynamics of African affairs was a major factor that sustained the journey from OAU to AU. Unfortunately, the African Union inherited both the administrative challenges and the developmental burdens faced by the defunct OAU. It seems that none of the other options suggested for funding the AU is currently feasible. One feels that the difficulties which bedevil the OAU with regards to funding may be worse with the AU. Those countries which could not pay half of what they were to pay will find it very difficult now. As for the big contributors like Nigeria, South Africa, Algeria, and Egypt, the burden will certainly grow heavier. That's an interesting thing to, to understand. And, you know, that goes back to these oppressive loans and stuff that a lot of these African countries have taken out. They don't have the, the monies uh, for development. All that goes back to, to the colonizers that gave them the loans. Since the emergence of the African Union, the challenge of political violence due to, to, due, due to electoral issues has worsened. In Cote d'Ivory and South Sudan, um, it led to civil war, while in Egypt, Algeria, and Mali, it transformed itself into hunger-driven revolutions, insurgency, terrorism, and counter-terrorist strategies that weaken the human rights status of these states. The future of economic integration of the continent is weakened by the challenges of advancing the national interests, as well as the desperate divide and rule neo-imperial agenda of foreign powers led by China. Ping Kong, Ping Kong, uh, EU, and the United States of America. There's also the push and pull effect of division within the continent over the legitimacy of some African leaders, which is often engineered by foreign interests. While Libya is a, uh, as a state, has collapsed from the dangerous form of domestic and international politics weighing heavily on that state, Central African Republic is caught up by the crisis of world religions, while Zimbabwe is under the threat of foreign alliance against Mugabe. Let me read that again. While Libya as a state has collapsed from the dangerous form of domestic and international politics weighing heavily on that state, Central African Republic is caught up by the crisis of world religions. Well, what's going on in the Central African Republic? Uh, and this crisis of world religions. Does anyone have, um, does anyone have any insight on that? There's also the problem of national interests of states as against the interests of Africa as a continent. That's true. It will, uh, it will be recalled that the realist ideology of states pushes the policymakers to think of their individual states first, before thinking of any other regional or continental body or policy. <clears throat> the crisis of poverty, unemployment, and illiteracy on the, on the citizenry of member states has demanded a fundamental challenge to the AU. So this will tell you some of the problems that's going on, right? Uh, poverty, unemployment, and illiteracy, right? And we talked about that illiteracy the other day uh, in terms of, you know, the illiteracy oftentimes is not in um, their home their home language, but it's 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 in the it's it's an illiteracy in the foreign language of the colonized. Poverty and unemployment go hand in hand, and again, this is why you got to drive industries in Africa. 
many weeks back, months back, I talked about like some of Africa's main problems, like, you know, difficulties in just feeding uh, her people, right? Uh, the idea that they import Chinese, or, sorry, Asian rice, when Africa has its own cultivar of rice, and they're not doing the scientific work, as well as the agricultural work, to increase the yield of rice to be able to better feed their people. In addition, as this paper just stated, and we've known this for a while now, you have the problem of leadership in, in, in Africa. African leadership is, is, has one hand holding, you know, uh, one hand holding some European countries' balls, and another hand uh, holding hands with Africa's elite, who themselves are holding on to the balls of someone in Europe. In the chat room, I see more activity. Pe Again, peace to all of you guys who are joining in. Uh, most times I've been doing shows of late. I've been getting a good few of you in the chat room and, you know, communicating, adding to the dynamics of, uh, of, the, uh, of the podcast. So uh, the Harsh Reality Podcast says, as long as the majority of African nations use EU currencies, you cannot build a power base. Uh, they go on to say, we know that the continent is the most resource-rich area in the world. Cell phones are not possible without precious metals exclusive of the continent. Should look into a resource-backed uh, resource currency. Hash Rally Podcast goes on to say, of course, even suggesting this will get you Gaddafi. Well, yeah, right? Um... Uh, Arthur Zur, who I mentioned earlier, our musician friend, says, all I know about Central Africa is that they are kept in wars so that the West have access to their resources. Absolutely. Absolutely. Central Africa is kept in some skirmish, right? Um, meanwhile, the resources are being toted out of there. Arthur Zur goes on to say, we need an economist to look at currency currency strategies, whether crypto or resource backed, also to talk about evolution of central banks to serve us. How can the central banks be integrated? Uh, he goes on to say, after Zero goes on to say, or well, use yam and other grains as opposed to rice. Yeah, that's what I was talking about, the rice cultivar. Use yam or other grains as opposed to rice. KW Don 7 says the life expectancy in the Central African Republic is 52.24 years old. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you add a, the last couple of comments, the skirmishes, the impoverishment, uh, you know, don't expect to live too long. In fact, you know, uh, feudal Europe was, was similar in that way. Constant skirmishes, impoverishment, and dudes didn't live much past 30 at one time. You know, uh, lack of, of uh, any kind of renaissance in medicine, et cetera, dudes didn't live that long. So we're, we're seeing that in parts of the continent right now, but it's being, it's, being, it's being generated to be that way. But again, we have, and again, again, I, I hate to keep saying it, but it's so friggin' important. It's all about the education. If folks aren't being educated to solve their own problems, there's destruction and demise. That's all that's left. That's all that's left. You want to talk about African solutions for African problems? Sure. But you got to talk about the African education to be able to understand how to produce those solutions. And when we look at, when we look at the diaspora, Right? Inside, outside the continent. We have too much great Africans around for being, like I said before, co-opted. Take a drink again for that. Co-opted, right, to other people's missions and other people's works. 
we got to start focusing on ourselves. But I, I don't want to lose sight of that uh, that discussion on on ideas of, of unifying. It's something that's been bandied around for a long time, talked about for a long time, and I've never really heard what these unifying strategies are, and I'm very curious to, you know, to talk about that with folks like yourselves here and, and others. And, and Arthur Zur had a great point too, which is something I'm trying to work on, is to really start getting, you know, African-centered folks, uh, uh, like an economist, right? And I think this came up in, um, in the Pan-African server the other day, like what's a, what's a, what was it again only? It was, what's a, what's a revolutionary economist or something like that, right? But we need to definitely get African-centered uh, economists on the job to continue. Today, we have the African Union, the descendant of these conferences, these beliefs and these philosophies. But does the union have a solution is it trying to find solutions to the questions raised by its forerunners? The issues of boundaries, languages, non-materialism, non-elitism, equality, and well-administered so, uh, socialist states. How can the immense problems inherent in trying to create a nation out of many people be resolved? <clears throat> it certainly has not been resolved in Europe. And without schools and schools without exercise books, see, it comes back to education. And without schools and schools without exercise books and texts and maps, what does the word Africa mean to the masses? Finally, while it might have been possible to gather people together initially to fight against racism and then to fight for independence, it is clearly not proving easy to unite governments to confront the new forms of imperialism from which too many individuals have grown very wealthy while the masses of the people remain in poverty. That's nothing but a whole word, as I like to say on this show, right there. You know, this is something that we should discuss at a date of you guys' choosing in particular, when I know that, and, and I say that to say when I know there's folks who are tuning in and who, who's gonna be participant, let's really sit down and talk about that. So this brings us to the healing balm of Pan-African ideologies. That sounds familiar to me. Uh, the term Pan-Africanism connotes centuries of suffering and hardship experienced by the descendants of Africa. The period of the suffering spans from the era of slavery to the period of scramble and partition of Africa, as well as the colonialism that followed. Ironically, Pan-Africanism today concentrates efforts in fighting the multiplier implications of foreign neo-imperialism on Africa and their descendants all over the world. The Pan-African flag, that was designed by Marcus Garvey with the popular red, black, and green colors were meant to connote the unification and liberation of African people. While uh, the red represents the blood of the dead Africans and their descendants whose blood was violently spilled as they struggled to retain their Africanness symbolizes the bond of African unity. The black in the flag represent the color of the original African people which still runs in the looks of their descendants. And, and that's the thing. The black in the flag represents the color of the original African people. So how are we gonna deal with the Arab problem? How are we going to deal with the Arab problem? The blackness connotes strength, energy, and strong uh, will that is evident in the life and the activities of Africans from the era of slavery to present. The green in the flag captures the rich African vegetation. The African continent has been exceptionally blessed with the gift of resource-filled vegetation. Which, which leads to the question, why so much kids are dying 
from illnesses related to malnutrition. It would be recalled—it it, it, it would be recalled Leopold Sadar Senghor's negritude movement fought for the enthronement and sustenance of traditional African culture and value systems. The rise of hip-hop artists across the globe is a contemporary manifestation of the place of pan-African spirit in promoting the economic, social, and political power as well as culture of the blacks. The problem with that statement is we don't own, we don't own it, right? Uh, it continues, they need to be strengthened. Paradoxically, while trying to manage the problem of national interest in the face of supranational idea of uh, continental unity, former president of Tanzania, Tanzania Julius Nyerere, stated that the role of African nationalism is different or should be different from the nationalism of the past, that the African national state is an instrument for the unification of Africa and not for diving Africa, that African nationalism is meaningless, is dangerous, is anachronistic, if it is not, at the same time, pan-Africanism, right? I'm pretty sure I remember uh, Oni Tasse quoting that quote before, too. Right? All that Nyerere is arguing is that the actors in African polit political leadership must think first of the collective interests of the continent before thinking of their domestic interests in areas where both interests come face to face. The opinion of Nyerere is close to the uh, position of the Ethiopian emperor Haile Selassie. Oh, sorry, the Ethiopian emperor, full stop. Haile Selassie stated during his opening remarks at the Independent African State Congress in Addis Ababa that African leaders must, in self-abnegation, press forward the economic, political, and spiritual welfare of their peoples in the interest not entirely of national gain, but of that transcendent continental unity which alone can bring to a close the era of colonialism and balkanization. Du Bois, in his address titled The Future of Africa, which was read to, all, to the All African People's Conference held in December 1958 at Accra, stated that if Africa unites, it will be because each parts, each nation, each tribe gives up a part of the heritage for the good of the whole. That is what the union means. That is what Pan-Africanism means. And my question to that, just to pause for a second here, my question to that is, you have to, this is where marketing and stuff comes into play, right? You have to really sell the benefits of that, right? Because we know human beings. If I go to you and I say, hey guys, put aside whatever it is you have in mind for yourself and just focus on, you know, put aside the, 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 the individual and just focus on, you know, what I'm trying to do. I would have to really sell that, right? You guys have your own projects, your own thoughts, th things you want to pursue, I'm telling you to put that aside for what I'm trying to build, right, even though it includes all of us or whatever, that's a hard set. You have to really market that. And you have to have surefire benefits for supporting that kind of ideology. At the, same, you know, at the end of the day, we, we got to remember, Africans are people too. And so you have to you have to reach out to Africans like you reach out to regular people. How are you going to go about doing that? To continue, according to Du Bois, 1965, Africa has nothing to lose in pursuing that form of unity except losing their chains, and by so doing, they have the continent to recover, as well as human dignity to regain in Africa. Nkrumah in 1960 often maintained that Africa 
had three alternatives. Firstly, to unite and save our continent. Secondly, to disunite and disintegrate. Or thirdly, to sell out to foreign powers. Underdog, put that on a t-shirt, right? So that brings us to the conclusion. Uh, before I get to the conclusion, I wanna remind you guys to make sure to check out other shows on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you to into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. And we're back. Make sure to check out those other shows. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share their content. Uh, if you're new here today, uh, I greet you with peace. But also make sure to subscribe. Uh, click the the bell for for notifications when I'm on, as well as give me a thumbs up if you will on the episode. Uh, we had a conclusion. Let me check in with the family in the chat room. Um, so we have uh, Baka Umubo says salute. Salute to you, uh, Baka Umubo. Athrazer says the economist Howard Nicholas, who I only discovered the other day, was talking about how the EU is a scramble to defend against the Eastern Bloc. Uh, at some level, leaders in Africa must realize that unification is the only way, but for internal problems, it is hard to work on that effort. Athrazer also says the healing bomb, ha. Huh. BALM, Black African Liberation Movement. I know that Black and African is redundant, but it addresses the Arab problem indirectly. Absolutely. KW Don 7 says the Arabs in the North and Boers in the South are big problems that have to be expelled. Yeah, we gotta, you know, we talk about, and I, I know these Arabs are white folks or whatever, but we talk about whitey in terms of Europeans most times. You know, at least thinking European most time, but we really got to deal with the Arab problem in Africa as well. And they're so entrenched in the continent. Man. Man. Uh, Arthur says, yes, we don't own the hip-hop, but it teaches us how we can infiltrate borders with a cultural agenda. Our bomb radio station, publishing house, podcast, etc., can be a cultural, a, a, a culture defining effort. I agree. I agree. Uh, but we need to also have ownership of these things as well. Uh, after this, we're going to say, "United, we united, we will stand. United, they will fall. Our unity will take care of so many issues." Many will be forced out and exposed when we unite. In our disunity, they flourish. Uh, the pro-black perspective says, I'm still thinking of that African economist thing. Uh, tell us, what are your thoughts, Oni, on that African, on that African economist thing? The Harsh Reality Podcast says, don't really need an economist, it's 2020. Have an intelligent person sit down and read, watch videos and audiobooks for a few months, and you could debate most economists. The Harsh, Harsh Reality Podcast says majority of economists are teachers at community colleges. Athrazer says, indeed, we need someone who can think in a sophisticated way about our issue, not being ideologically aligned with capitalist or Marxist nonsense. Those are just names. All bogged down in socialism versus dot dot dot. I hated a term that Obama used. He said he was a a non ideological pragmatist. But there's something to that phrase that makes sense. <clears throat> Baka uh, Umubu says we need to create our own economic system. 
independent of European capitalism and socialism. Uh, I want to go back to something that the Hash Reality Podcast says. We don't really need economists. Um, you know, I, and I, and I, I get where, I kind of get where you're coming from when you say that, right? <clears throat> But that's like me saying I don't need a doctor, right? Like I'll just sit down and read some books and and and, 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 and audiobooks for a few months and I could I could do the same thing they do. Well, there's some truth in that, but you know, there's some truth in that I'll be able to do some of the things, but you can't disregard a person who's been fully immersed in a topic, right? And has put in years of study. Now the problem is the problem is, where are you getting this economist from? That's the major problem. Where are you getting this economist from? Because if you get it from, you know, one of these uh, historically white universities or what have you, uh, there's a term for that and I can't remember what it is, PW something. But anyway, if you get it from these historically white um, um, colleges, you have to really then look at the, the pedigree, the background of this economist, right? Uh, but it, you know, it's something that should be considered. Someone who, who, who understands economics inside and out, macro, microeconomics inside out, but who has, you know, an African center is what I think is, is what we should look at. I'm not disregarding your point entirely. I'm just saying that I think there's something to having knowledgeable people who already have the knowledge to get in their boots on the ground and get to work, but they must be African centered. Oh no, I'm not I'm not assuming you're speaking from a place of ignorance. No, I'm not that's not the case at all. Uh <laughs> salute to the GI Bill. Okay, so the GI Bill didn't work for you, huh, brother? That's good to hear. I, I've heard some horror stories about the GI Bill for others, but uh, but yeah, I know me in no way or shape or fashion am I saying that you're ignorant on anything. Right? I'm just saying that uh, I I do believe there is a place for the initiated, and if you have uh, degrees in economics and and whatnot, then you should be one of the people that we're definitely. Uh, talking with when we have this discussion, right? Like for example, I mean, I have, you know, I have degrees in biology. I also have a degree in business management. I am in no form or fashion the person to speak to about creating an economic system, right? Uh, free of socialism and capitalism. I think there are other people who are better, who are better inclined to do that than me. Uh, Arthur there says, yeah, shout out to, uh, salute to the GI Bill. Yeah, absolutely. Salute to the GI Bill. Um, I, and see, that's why it's good to talk about stuff. You know, my understanding from many people who I've actually spoken to about the GI Bill was that it didn't really work for them. And then some people will say, well, it's how you make it work for you. But I guess uh, for the brother... Uh, from the Hosh Reality Podcast, D Web, I guess. Um, <clears throat> I guess that's uh, what you did. So we had the conclusion now. Uh, D Web, I have your number. Yeah, so you you definitely will be one of the people I need inside of this conversation, right? Uh, so for the conclusion of this paper, and again, I want to thank everyone who's been uh, speaking. Um. Inside the chat room, you guys have made the show much more dynamic by doing so, and I appreciate you. Love to everyone. In conclusion, the paper says, this work has traced the origin of Pan-Africanism. It showed how the multiple dynamics of foreign exploitation and, de and dehumanization for some individuals and groups to champion the African course leading to Pan-Africanism. The paper revealed that it was the meetings of the different Pan-African leaders give birth to the OAU, that in turn led to the rise of the AU. So we're talking genealogy here. The article showed the need for the preservation of the African heritage 
while acknowledging that the AU, which is the grandchild of Pan-Africanism, is now faced with the crisis of conflicts, national interests, politics of regionalism, etc. It therefore recommended the promotion of continental positions, as championed by a number of late Pan-Africanists, Pan especially in the face of the growing North-South divide in global politics, as a way to ensure sustainable African development at the long run. And that's the end of the paper. Um, is there any uh, other comments or clarifications anyone wants to post? I'll read them off on air and I'll, I'll discuss. Um, Athrazer says, thank you for persisting and creating this space. Love and respect, yeah, love and respect to everyone who can hear my voice right now or in the near future. Uh, Harsh Reality Podcast says, salute, by the way, great show. I appreciate that from you guys. You guys be putting out some great shows as well. <clears throat> so that's, uh, you know, that's the thing, I guess, KW Don said he pre prefers uh, a gradual process, uh, which I prefer as well, um, in, in terms of integrating all of the continent. Uh, we have uh, Athrazer says the people should focus on, and, and, you know, this makes sense, you know, focus on yam instead of rice. Uh, Harsh Reality Podcast says we don't need economists necessarily. We can sit down and do the work. And, that, and that's true, too. And that's, you know, that's also a part of, like, you know, the idea of, like, building a curriculum is about, it's not just for kids to learn. It's also for the adults in charge of these kids to also learn. So it's, it's, it's not a bad idea to, you know, to figure out uh, how to how to transmit knowledge in economics, macro, micro, etc., right? And 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 also to to join that to the idea of what Baka Umubu said, which is to create our own economic system. Right? What would our own economic system look like to you guys, if you don't mind? Um, if you don't mind just uh, talking to me about that, what would our own economic system kind of look like? And after that, we will wrap the show. Shout out to Sister Renee. I guess she got busy. I haven't. Um, I haven't heard from her. Uh, only to say, from the pro-black perspective, let's make sure and talk about that 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 unity class that you you're putting on as well. But it seems like uh, I don't have any more comments, questions in the chat. Um, so by all means, I will end the show here. It's been a great time once again to be able to to speak to you guys while doing this show. Uh, thanks again, and I will be back today. It's Thursday, right? I will be back on Saturday to do another show. Um, let's um, let's table the unity discussion for maybe a week from now, uh, if not Thursday next Saturday. Uh, I know that's around the holiday time, but uh, let's see if we could table that for another week out so we could get it, you know, all set up nicely, make sure everyone knows what's going on and they'll be there to participate. But until next time, family, this has been the Bit of Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Beta Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Beta Medicine Show, Twitter, Beta Meds, Tumblr, Bitter Meds, Instagram, Bitter Medicine.